Well... How about you start? I can try. We recently learned why plates move, how we know they move, and how we know where the edges of plates are. And one of those ways to do that was by looking at the energy released by earthquakes. The next thing to learn about is what is an earthquake and how we can determine where to find them. So what we're looking for is the center of the earthquake. That's how we can pinpoint where these plates are moving. You can see in this little picture that the fault is that crack in the earth and when the slip happens there is a location where the energy is released called the focus and directly above the surface is what we call the epicenter. Right Now in both cases the energy moves out from the center in all directions. So it moves outward from the focus, both downward, outward, and upward, and that upward energy hits the epicenter which then moves outward from the center. So there's two ways that the earth can shake. There's what we call P waves or primary waves or S waves or secondary waves that come by. The primary waves are the first waves that are released and they move longitudinally. They move back and forth and you can see that blue little dot shakes forward and backwards with the pulse. That's the way I kind of remember a P wave. The uh, other way that they move, a secondary wave or an S wave, moves perpendicular to the motion of the wave and it looks like this. It's more like an ocean wave. It does. As it passes you. Now if you're Right on top of the epicenter, which one hits you first? Well, the P waves move more quickly. That's why they're called primary waves. The S waves, which are secondary waves, don't move as fast. So if you are very, very close to the epicenter, you will feel them practically simultaneously, depending on how deep the actual earthquake was. So we need a way to measure these. And so the devices that we use are called seismometers. And they display their information on a graph. So we call it a seismograph. Basically all you do is you have a pencil that in this case is on a mass to hold it steady and as the earth shakes the pencil draws a picture. The bigger the picture on the graph the stronger the earthquake is. And you can see from the animation here that that primary wave is coming first, shakes the pencil first, and then the secondary wave comes in. But it's not really the pencil that's shaking. The pencil stays put. What is shaking? The actual table, the earth. So the table's attached to the earth and the earth does the shaking. That's correct. But we're on the earth so we see just the pencil move because we're right. in the shaking frame. So what we have here now is three different station readings for seismographs. And you can see with these three stations there's different distances between when the P wave, the primary wave hits, and when the secondary wave hits. Which of these three stations to you is the closest? Well, the closest station would be the one where the primary and secondary waves are closest together uh, because they would have less time to separate. And therefore, station C is the one that's closest because the primary waves and secondary waves hit more closely together. So the big thing we want to get out of these is when you see a seismograph, find when the P wave arrives and then find when the S wave arrives. That's going to tell you so in this one, you can see the P wave and S wave arrival for, say, station A in San Francisco. And that gives you a time difference of about 4 minutes and 10 seconds. You do that and repeat that trial for each station that does the measuring. What we're seeing is something called a travel time graph, which basically creates a curve for the S waves and the P waves and the amount of time it takes them to go certain distances. So P waves get there faster. You can see that it only took 9 minutes for this P wave to travel six kilometers or five and a half kilometers where it took the S wave about 16 minutes to travel that same distance. Right, and you can see they get progressively further apart the further away you get from the origin. So to figure out the actual distance we need that time difference of the P wave S wave arrival and you can see those two little red lines indicate the four minutes and ten seconds we got from station A. So here's what they do. They take that time gap and they lay it onto this graph to see where the P and S wave match up with that given time distance. If there's no time distance, you can see you'd be right here at the epicenter, at the origin. Since the, these two stations had a four minute time delay, I can go straight down from that line and see that we're around 2,800 kilometers from center of the earthquake. So once we have that information, we know the distance that a station is from an earthquake, we now need to figure out where the heck that earthquake is. We said that earthquake was over here in San Francisco, and let's say that it was around 2,800 kilometers from San Francisco. Where do I go? Well, you go to that spot on the earth, so we can go 2,800 kilometers from that center point. 
Okay, so I'll take a line and draw 2,800 kilometers north. So we know at the very least the earthquake could be at that single point there, but actually what you want to do is not go in one single direction. Remember that the earthquake waves travel in all directions, so we need a circle around that city. That's pretty good. And now you have a circle of 2,800 kilometers around the entire city of Los Angeles, which says that the earthquake must be somewhere along that line. All right, so we found the earthquake then. We did not find the earthquake. No. Because just like... <laughs> Come on. Because just like a GPS system, we need to do a triangulate position. Triangulate. So triangles, three. Three. We can't just use one station. We need, we need three. three. So let's say we picked another station down here in Peru that also measured that earthquake, and they measured it, let's say, only 2,000 kilometers from them. How would that be any different than what we just did? Well, it wouldn't be any different except that the circle would be smaller. So you would measure again a distance of about 2,000 kilometers, creating a circle of that size around the center. Right now, so now we know where the earthquake is. No, because this is still not triangulating. This is biangulating. Do I have I narrowed it down though? You have narrowed it down. It's somewhere between the two intersecting spots on the two circles. So now I've got a 50-50 shot. So I'll just guess. You could just guess and you could be wrong. Or you could be right. So what we need is a third city with a third distance. Let's Iceland. pick Iceland. Say Iceland also measured the earthquake. They can measure an earthquake that far away? Oh yeah, they can measure an earthquake from the other side of the earth. Wow. Iceland gets their measurement and it's many, many kilometers from them. So now if we place a third circle around that guy, three circles intersect. If we can imagine that those dots are right in the center of each one of those circles, at those distances, we have a spot on the globe right there where the three circles intersect, which is then the epicenter. So we found an epicenter by plotting P and S waves, finding time differences between the P and S waves to get a circle or a radius of each of those locations. Three intersections tell us the exact epicenter of your earthquake. We'll talk next time. We will.